Hello. Hello, I see people are starting to sign on. Hello and welcome. Hope you're all having a good day. I wanted to um, welcome you to our webinar, Getting to Know Your Scientific Community. My name is Charisty Bourne, and I will be your host. I have worked in applied research centers and labs. I've been a corporate trainer. I've also been a STEM teacher for seven years, and I taught around 3,000 students during this time and wrote and implemented about 70 lesson plans for NGSS, which is our new um, science standards. It's called Next Generation Science Standards. I now work for a wonderful company called Elam Bio. And before we get started, I wanted to share a little bit information about how our webinar is gonna work in case you haven't been on one of our webinars before. We have a Q&A section that's on the very bottom of your screen. And if you click on the Q&A section, you can type in questions at any time. And um, you can even type them in when the panelist is speaking and it won't interrupt her. I will just hold your questions until it's time for um, our Q&A. And we'll have a couple of them during the session. Um, but anytime you have a question, go ahead and feed that right through. Um, I did wanna let you know this call is being recorded and will later be posted onto YouTube. Um, no one can see your face, so you don't have to worry about that. And I just wanted to let you know when you would type in a question, I'm not gonna share who the question is coming from just for confidentiality. So I won't say your name, but please know that we very much appreciate all of your questions. And um, that's the fun part about having a webinar live. You get to ask your question live to our experts. Today's um, webinar is sponsored by my company, Elam Bio. Elam Bio is busy supporting researchers on the front lines of COVID-19. And we're very proud of all of these people that are helping with our big problem. We wanted to make sure to reach out during this unusual time, and we felt the best way to do this is to help feed future curiosity of um, science and help other scientists that are coming up, our future scientists. Um, the best way we thought to do that would be to meet some really cool scientists in our community, and I have a great scientist to introduce to you today. Today's panelist is Katya Berker. Katya is um, getting her PhD. She's a PhD candidate and an American Heart Association Fellow at SVP, which is here in San Diego. Her current research uses fruit flies to explore and better understand the genetics of heart disease. Katya speaks three languages and has received awards and honors for her ability to clearly present scientific information. And now, what you've all been waiting for, I'm gonna hand over the floor to Katya. Katya, could you tell us a little bit more about your background and your current research? Yes, for sure. So I'm just going to share my presentation right now. Is this easy to see? Yes, that looks wonderful. Great, okay. Well, thank you very much, Kirsty, for the kind introduction. And again, my name is Katya Berker and I am a graduate student in San Diego. And I'd like to just give a little bit of background about me and the work that I do and the lab that I work in. And again, feel free to write as many questions that you have. I'm kind of intrigued to hear what you have to say and to um, ask about the work that I do. So a little bit about me. Um, as you can see in the, the top picture, I have two siblings, uh, two younger siblings, and I actually come from a background that has a lower amount of scientists in my family. And it's something that we can talk a little bit more after about, but for me, being a scientist is kind of scary and was sort of scary to start off because people in my family aren't really scientists. As you can see, my grandparents here are actually butchers, not scientists. Um, but it's been really amazing to be able to work in this space and get to meet other scientists and feel more comfortable overall because for a lot of you, you know, you see this um, traditional crazy scientist with a big lab coat and goggles and well, I, I'm not like that and I've met a lot of other people who are not really like that either. I'm also not from here. I'm international. I come from Canada, from British Columbia, which is straight up north, basically from San Diego. And I came to San Diego to start my schooling as a PhD student. And here we go. Okay, so 
I'm a student just like many of you on the line are. I ended up doing my bachelor's degree in biology back in Canada. And then I wanted to do my PhD in San Diego. And so that's what I'm doing now. I am at SBP uh, graduate program, as you can see the logo on the left hand side. And I'm also an American Heart Association fellow. And what that means is that I wrote a little bit of information about the work that I was wanting to do. And I submitted that to the AHA and they liked it and they were able to fund part of my research. So that's pretty exciting as well. And here's just a picture of, well, now most of the members of my lab, a lot of people come in and come out. So it's changed a little bit, but uh, that's most of us there. Okay, so I actually spend almost all of my time studying fruit flies, just like the flies that you see when you move a banana or an orange from, a fruit, the, from the fruit bowl coming out. And the scientific name for them is Drosophila melanogaster, which some of you uh, maybe in high school might recognize as well. And you can see on the right hand side, there are some, some flies and vials and we can do a huge array of different studies in fruit flies. In, in the picture on the right, you see some flies aren't really climbing as well. So they actually have some muscle defects relative to the other flies. And it's uh, something that's very striking that you can, you can see right away uh, from this image. So we use fruit flies or Drosophila for a huge amount of reasons. And a few of those would include that they have a really short life cycle and lifespan. And there's tons of resources actually available online for us to collaborate with other researchers and figure out about um, certain genes that are found in flies and to also receive different flies from other researchers in completely different areas of the world. The fruit flies are actually quite inexpensive. They're super tiny, as we all know. And so we're able to house a whole bunch of flies um, together in our lab. Whereas if you worked with a different model system, for example, mice or rats, then you wouldn't be able to house as many of them as we can in our lab. And the final point, and I think it's the most important point actually, is that the fly genes are actually very similar to human genes a lot of the time. And that sort of directly relates back to my research where I'm trying to understand what genes are involved in certain types of heart disease. So that heart disease that I'm currently working on is a bit of a mouthful. It's called hypoplastic left heart syndrome or HLHS and babies are born with this disease. And as you can see on the right picture of the heart there, the left ventricle in those babies is really, really small. And what that means is that they're not able to pump oxygen rich blood to the rest of the body. And so actually it's quite a devastating disease. If they're not treated through surgeries, then they likely will not make it to adulthood. And these babies require surgeries starting at only two weeks of age, which is really young. And as you can imagine, doing surgery on, on such a, a small human being is, is quite um, terrifying in the end. So what we want to do is to understand what genes are different in those babies who have this heart disease and potentially what are some ways of actually targeting them so that we can make sure that those babies who have HLHS are as healthy as possible. And so again, we use the fruit flies to study this. And I have a, a couple of pictures and videos, which I think are kind of cool. On the left hand side, you can see a fruit fly. You can see that it's wings are splayed out to the left and right side and you see this sort of long uh, green tube and that's actually the fly heart. So the way that I like to think of the fly heart is if we were to sort of look at where our vertebrae are on our in our back, um, sort of here in our back, that's that's pretty much where the fruit fly heart lies and um, 
I'll just show you a little video here. What we do is we actually dissect the fruit flies, uh, which is kind of crazy. And we use tools that surgeons actually will be using um, in order to dissect, open the body cavity to reveal the fly heart. And then we're able to take these videos and hopefully you can see this in the yellow box there. So that is in fact a fruit fly heart beating. And what was pretty exciting is that recently someone in my lab, along with another collaborator, were able to develop this line where we have the fly hearts actually fluorescing. So it's like a, a bright heart. And we're able to just film the hearts directly through the cuticle tissue or directly through their backs in order to visualize it. And that means we don't have to dissect the flies anymore, which actually is sometimes kind of painful and, and definitely takes some, some time. So there's a, a nice video there of one of those hearts that is um, fluorescing and it's just uh, bright color so that you can see it really easily, especially with that nice contrast there. And it's a, a great technique that we're able to use that's um, pretty new to our lab. Apart from taking the videos, we can also do some microscopy and take images of the fly heart. And I have sort of a zoomed in uh, picture from left to right here. And that is in fact the fly heart. And I think that it's interesting to look at the picture on the right hand side, because if you look at your computer screen, and look at that picture on the right side there. And then imagine how big a fly actually is. Imagine just that there was a fly right on your screen beside it, and you're able to see um, with such a clear resolution the actual fly heart. So we're able to do lots of different experiments in this way and get really awesome, beautiful pictures in the end. And finally, I, I figured that I would take some pictures and just walk everyone through a little bit of my lab. When I was in uh, elementary school and middle school, I don't think I had ever walked in a lab before. So um, maybe it's kind of interesting to see what my lab looks like. And a lot of things that, that look um, that you can see in my lab are actually quite similar to other scientists lab as well. So this is my bench. This is where I work. You can see there's lots of nice Canadian flags hanging all over the place and some pictures all around. My family likes to send me awesome stuff back from Canada and I always put it up in the lab to kind of cheer me up whenever I need. And I have a computer, so I have sort of a computer workspace in my lab. And then I also have a research bench as well and that's where I'll do a lot of my experiments. And um, let me see what else. There's a fume hood in there that we will work with certain chemicals with. There's lots of pipettes all over the place. There's lots of fly vials all over the place. And there's tons of tape all over my lab because we actually label the different fly vials with tape. And as you can um, see here on the very right hand side, there's loads of colorful tape all over the place. And, well, my favorite color is rainbow actually. And so I just put different colors of tape all over my stuff and color code everything. So it looks a little bit crazy, but um, it's actually pretty organized, I think, um, at least in my head right now. And then we have these fly sorting stations because as you can imagine, if you want to look at the flies, you can't just open up a vial, they'll, they'll fly all over the place. So what we do is we actually use carbon dioxide and that lets the flies fall asleep. They will wake up again, uh, maybe one minute later. And we put them on this um, little thing we call a fly pad. And we look at them under the microscope and you can see different colors of the fruit flies and different shapes that they have. You can look whether male or female and um, it's, um, it's pretty efficient that way, the, how they have this set up in the end. And we actually move the, the fruit flies around with paintbrushes like you would buy from an art store. So kind of um, 
interesting. Some things are, are so simple in our lab, like using paintbrushes and other things are much more complex, like some of the microscopes that we use. And I wanted to include this because I, well, I think personally it's kind of fun. Um, we have to get rid of a lot of the flies. There's only certain flies that we want in the end. And so we normally go to the sorting station where we're sorting for flies that we want and we get rid of the flies that we don't want. And we get rid of them by putting them in these little containers that have oil in them and was really nice. It recently got replaced. And so it's a nice fresh one at our station now, but after a while they end up looking like a thick soup and um, they're all contained, so it's definitely safe. We call it a fly morgue, and um, I just like to show it because I think it's funny and it shows how many flies we go through in our lab because this whole container is just stuffed and thick with the amount of flies that are there. Uh, we store the flies in incubators and on people's desks, and sort of interestingly, a lot of the flies will actually have slower development when they're kept at lower temperatures. And since uh, COVID-19 has been happening, we've been putting a lot of our flies at lower temperatures so that we don't have to take as much care of them lately because we're trying to reduce the amount of time that we're visiting the lab right now. So this is a good snapshot of a lot of the, the boxes and vials that the scientists have in my lab. And I just did a little calculation here. I was thinking to myself, there's maybe roughly 250 flies per vial at all different life stages. And each of the scientists in my lab have lots of vials of flies, maybe 400. And that actually makes 100,000 flies per scientist that we're keeping care of. So if you compare that to mice or rats, you can imagine that a single scientist can't actually look after 100,000 um, mice, for example. So um, this really allows us to work with all these different genes that we're exploring and do so, as you can see, with all of them in a single um, incubator or fridge. We also have a lot of traditional common lab equipment. So we have um, Erlenmeyer flasks and beakers that we use to store some of our chemicals. And then we have lots of freezers in our lab. It's just like a, a fridge or freezer that you'd have at home, actually. We're able to store a lot of the equipment. And typically, you'll, you'll see this in, in most labs around my research institute. Um, and that's kind of something uh, typical, I guess, from a lab that you'd see. And then finally, this is just a little picture of me actually dissecting the fruit flies. So I'm sitting there with the blonde ponytail and I'm using these little teeny tiny scissors and, and tweezers or forceps to sort of reveal the fly heart as I talked about before. This woman here is another PhD candidate who actually left our lab, uh, graduated uh, from our lab recently. And we have a camera attached to the microscope. And so you're able to see me dissecting the fruit flies. And we had some visitors to our lab, so they kind of wanted to see what this looks like. So that's just a little walkthrough um, about me and about my project and about the, the lab environment that I am living in almost every day. Wonderful, thank you so much. We really learned a lot. I'm sure all the people did. We have quite a few questions. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, the first question is, how big is the heart compared to the fly? Yeah, it's a good question. So I'm going to just go back here. I think this is the best picture here. So you could almost imagine that the whole fly, the fly, can you see actually my mouse right now when I yes. move it around? Okay, great. Yeah. So the, the, the head of the fly is actually here. I'm just kind of circling it. And then you also have the thorax and the abdomen. And so the fruit fly heart actually runs lengthwise about half of the fly body, but it's also very narrow. So it's quite thin um, if you look at it from, I guess in this case, a horizontal perspective. Um, but lengthwise, it's about half the size of the fly. Wonderful. And another question is, how do you make the heart green? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, actually. So um, maybe just to put it simply at the moment, if there's more questions, we can dive into it a bit more. We're able to basically tag certain genes and we use um, a reporter system, it's called. And in that way, we're able to insert these reporters into the flies when they're um, really, really young, like babies, and then we're able to actually see the heart in that way. And you can use reporters for all different kinds of things in the fruit flies. So you can make certain things glow certain colors um, all, all around the fly. In, in this example, we're just looking at the heart. Wonderful. And another question is related a little bit to that. Um, do you know what color the fly's blood is? Yes. So actually, interestingly, the fly's blood is clear. It doesn't have any color to it. The only color that I typically see if I'm dissecting the fly is the color from the eyes of the fly. They're normally like a really bright uh, red or orange color. And if accidentally one of them gets smushed, it, it kind of looks like it would be blood, but the actual blood of the fly is, is clear. Oh, wow. That's super interesting. Um, do you, some questions about your storage. Do you ever use nitrogen for your storage or is it always in the refrigerator? Was the question liquid? Um, yeah, liquid nitrogen. Yeah, so we typically only use liquid nitrogen if we're trying to something called snap freeze some of the flies. And at that point, they will be dead. We can't actually cryo freeze our flies. So we just use the incubators right now. If we were to put the flies in even just a freezer, I don't think that they would survive very long. There's a lot of questions about what you would let after you're done with the fly. You just ever let it go outside free? You bring them home? <laughs> What, what happens with them when they're all done? Yeah, so when the flies are done, they, they go into this morgue that I was showing before. Just kind of get to that. Um, a lot of them will go into this morgue when they're all done and then they'll be safely disposed of. We also have um, special waste removal of the flies and so they'll be um, safely removed by other people at my institute because you're not really supposed to put an animal in the garbage can. And since the flies are animals, we're not supposed to just put them in the garbage can. Um, but maybe I'll share kind of a funny story related to that. And so I, I have a friend from my lab who used to do their um, studies at a different research institute, not where I'm working right now. And they said that, one day they were called by the subway downstairs, like the, the, the sandwich shop. And the people there were saying, there's so many flies all around the place. What is, what is going on right now? And they said, well, we're operating like we normally are. And then they ended up looking at some of the, the videotape footage from their lab. And they realized that there was someone in their lab who was actually going up to the top of the building and releasing the flies because they wanted them to live instead of die afterwards. And the flies were all going back down into the subway and ruining everyone's food in the end. So that's an improper way of uh, disposing of fruit flies, but it's kind of a, a funny story that I've heard of. Thing I also live in San Diego. I appreciate that you don't release them. Otherwise I might have more of them on my bananas. <laughs> um, one of your cousins actually is on the call and has a question and wants to know, um, if, how you know how, if the flies have heart disease, how they carry it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. So the hearts look, let's go back a few slides. The hearts definitely look different than our hearts do. Um, let's just go here. So that's a human heart and that's a, a fruit fly heart. So they look quite different. There are some similarities, but we're able to extract certain um, parameters um, that actually look somewhat similar to human hearts. So some of the things that we can measure are 
the size of the hearts if they look a lot larger. Like some humans will have certain heart disease where their hearts look a lot larger. We can see that in the flies as well. And another example is arrhythmicity. Um, human, uh, humans will sometimes develop arrhythmicity. Um, it's especially common as one ages. And we can actually measure arrhythmicity in our fly heart. So there's certain things that we're able to measure um, when we're taking these videos. And I don't have an example here, but I mean, this, this video that we're looking at, the hearts are contracting quite nicely. It doesn't look like there's much arrhythmicity, um, but some of the lines are pretty darn ugly that we see actually. And in fact, some of them will even be missing part of their hearts. Um, and that's a very striking phenotype or um, uh, something very interesting to see in the flies. Yeah, wow, that would be pretty hard to live. Do they all have lungs as well? In, in addition to hearts, they have the same anatomy as we do in general? Yeah, so a lot of the rest of the anatomy actually is quite different in flies. So they don't actually have lungs. They're able to circulate a lot of oxygenated blood through the heart itself. And um, it's sort of an open circulatory system, as we call it. Oh, okay, great. Another question is, um, do flies have different type of blood than we do? And um, is that different than our blood? Do they have different blood types? What, what makes their blood the same and different than ours? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think I can partially answer it from the best of my knowledge right now. The, the, the fly blood is quite similar to ours, but like I said, it's an open circulatory system. So it's basically pumping the solution that's going everywhere in the fly. Whereas in our own bodies, it's not, I mean, it's going everywhere, but it's going in a very um, uh, specific kind of pattern through our body. And in terms of the composition of the blood, I do think that it is somewhat similar, but it is still different from ours. And I, it's a great question about the blood types. I don't know. I would suspect not, just because the fly system is generally a lot simpler to ours. Um, but it's a, it's a very interesting question. And how did you learn how to dissect such a small creature? Is that something they taught you in school or in your lab, or did you just figure that out on your own? Well, I definitely did not figure it out on my own. <laughs> it's, it's actually quite hard to do, and it requires a lot of focus and really, really good microscopes and really good tools as well. So like I mentioned before, we have these tools that surgeons will also use on human patients for little sort of fine dissections themselves. And those have to be really sharp um, and very fine because when you look under the microscope, you know, everything looks so much larger and it looks like you wouldn't be able to do it. But in the end, practice really makes perfect for this sort of a thing. And I had to practice a lot for it. And a lot of people in my lab have to practice a lot for it. And it's, it's not, it's pretty frustrating at the start, actually, because you just want to be able to do it perfectly and you can't. But over time and over practicing it for a few days and a few weeks, then then you can get really good at it. And actually, it'll be interesting because I haven't been doing as many dissections over the last two months while we've been uh, partially shut down. So my skills might be a little bit worse when I get back <laughs> as well. You must have very steady hands as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. People are not supposed to drink coffee beforehand, they say. Oh, yeah, I would totally <laughs> expect that would, <laughs> would definitely affect. Um, oh, this is a really good question. How do you determine if a fly is male versus female? And is that something that you even take into account for your research? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're able to see certain body parts on the flies and also their um, coloration and size will be a little bit different. And for me, I have quite a trained eye when looking and sorting fruit flies that if I were to have one in my hand right now, I'd, I'd actually be able to tell if it's a male or female. But typically we put them under the microscope and then you can see quite easily 
again, the different body parts, size and, and coloration of the flies. And so you can determine that way. Um, and then for us right now, we actually use mostly females. And the reason for that is that the females are larger than the males typically. And so they're a lot easier for us to dissect and work with. Um, when we do have to work with the males, sometimes it's more painful when we have to do the, the dissections. Wow. Um, I heard you talking about how you're not in the lab as much. How often are you going in now with everything with the change with COVID-19? So about two about 10 days ago we actually had a phase one opening at my research institute and in my lab so lately i've been able to go in for up to four hour shifts and i have to sign up for those shifts and then be very careful that other people aren't in close proximity to me and we have to do a lot more cleaning um, prior to that sort of the the couple of months where we were more shut down i volunteered to be one of the individuals from my lab who would go in and kind of check that everything looked safe and then i was only going in once or twice per week which is really low <laughs> for what i what i typically do yeah lots of big changes for lots of people but it's nice that you get to go back a little bit again now yeah. um we had another question about other animals, do mm -hmm. things like bunnies also get this heart disease, um, or is it just humans and flies? Yeah, it's a that's an interesting question too. So this disease, let's go back here. The disease that we're working on, HLHS. I'm I'm actually not sure specifically with bunnies if they're able to get it. We know that there are some labs that work with mice and they've been able to show that the mouse can actually get sort of a similar heart to these babies with hlhs so i'm not sure how many different animals are able to develop hlhs but as a scientist something that we actually also try to do is to minimize the amount of um, animals that we're actually looking at so we don't want to just have to open up or even kill certain animals just to tell if they actually have this disease or not. So it might not be very well known whether a whole lot of other animals can actually develop HLHS. Um, that's really interesting. I, lo I love the different model organisms and how we're able to find out a lot of things about us um, in a safe way and how scientists think about what they're doing. A lot of people maybe don't understand and realize there's a lot of thought going into the process of what model organisms we're choosing. Yes. Um, another question is, do you feed the fruit flies different diets and see different results because of it? Interesting. Yes, we do actually. So some people in my lab, they look at the effects of a high fat diet on the fruit flies and what they do is they take the typical fruit fly food and they add coconut oil to it because coconut oil is really high in fat. So they mix that in the food and then they let the flies eat that. And then they're able to see that the hearts do in fact look different. Um, if I remember correctly, it almost looks like the, the flies have aged quicker than normal when they do have this high fat diet. But you could feed them lots of different things. You can do a high sugar diet as well. Um, and interestingly, that's how a lot of labs will actually deliver drugs to test in flies is, is they'll put it inside of the food and then they're able to eat it and um, absorb the drugs in the end. Wow. Really. You know, a lot of, lot of different things you can do with a fly. I'm sure there's a lot of participants on our call that are just having their mind blown because they just <laughs> have a pest that is attacking their fruit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this, the stuff that I'm showing you right now is really just a subset of the research that's going on in fruit flies. There's so many, there's so many other labs out there who are studying all different parts of the fruit fly. So you can imagine we're quite narrowly focused on the hearts, but you can study 
so many other organs and tissue types in the flies as well. Um, do you have people you collaborate with and work with in your lab and for your research? Yes, so I have some people in my lab who I work with directly for my project. And then we also have some collaborators and we actually have a, a group of us who are working on this HLHS project. So we have research collaborators from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And interestingly, they're the ones who are actually um, handling the data from the babies and patients with HLHS. And then they send us that information and we're able to test it with our fruit flies. And then we have a few other collaborators who are also involved in that so that we can kind of get this more um, holistic approach to HLHS. Wow, that's a wonderful example of how the medical community and scientific community share information um, and communicate and how scientists communicate with each other as well. Yes. Um, what do you like to do when you're not working? Are you at the lab all the time or are you? <laughs> There's stuff as well. <laughs> I am at the lab a good amount of time, but when I get done, typically um, on the weekdays, I like to de-stress a little bit and go do a workout or go do a run outside. I really love walking too, so oftentimes I'll go for walks and call my friends and family, and that's really nice time for me. On the weekends, sometimes I will go into work and do some experiments um, in the lab. And then other times I often go visit my boyfriend actually, and we spend the weekend together with him and his wonderful family and awesome dogs. So then we do more walks with dogs. And <laughs> that's typically what my week uh, and weekend is comprised of. That's fun. It's fun for the students to know that you don't spend, you spend time in the lab, of course, but you also have a life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And for me, I really feel like that's important because if I don't take that little bit of time off, then I feel more exhausted when I get back to it. So when I take a weekend and I do work, a lot of work over the weekend, and then I go back into Monday, um, I can often feel it. And sometimes that just has to get done depending on how the experiments are going. But I, I try to, to take at least a little bit of time out so that I can feel more refreshed when I get back to it. Yeah, that's great. How did you become interested in science? I know you mentioned your grandparents were butchers. They probably didn't imagine you would be um, dissecting fruit flies when they were a butcher. <laughs> how did you get interested in science um, during your path of schooling? So, Back in middle school, actually, I was taking some classes and starting to realize that I really wanted to understand more about the human body and how it sort of functions and then how it also malfunctions and what are some of those things that we could do to treat those humans. And so naturally with that, I was more familiar with doctors or physicians and so then I, th I thought, well, I want to become a doctor then. That's something that I'm really passionate about. And so when I went into high school, I kept taking my science courses and kept having that strong passion. And then I did my biology degree. And then I started working in a lab during that time. And I thought, actually, I kind of like this too. This is really interesting, innovative stuff that nobody else has ever worked on before. And that was quite thrilling, I think, for me. So then I ended up kind of thinking more um, scientists, uh, research scientists might be a, a better path. And I have worked in, let's see, four labs so far and really enjoyed all of my time in them. So I think that um, they've definitely kept me um, in a good place. And I still feel like I'm contributing work that will better um, humanity and people themselves, um, because this stuff is directly related to babies who actually have a really serious heart disease. So it's still, it's still thrilling work that I get to do. That's wonderful, yeah, I agree. I have another question about the heart disease in babies and why is that 
effect happening? Why do babies get heart disease? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. So some of the times there's these environmental, environmental factors, and then there's sometimes these genetic factors. And we're really interested in the genetic factors here. And for HLHS, we don't know exactly what's going on to cause the babies to have these um, uh, very different hearts. But what we think is that it's some sort of a, a combination of different mutations in different genes that then causes the baby to actually develop this, this very different heart. Um, so it's a good question, but I can't explain it specifically because it's what my project is trying to understand. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. I love it. And so it sounds like they got down to understanding what you were studying. So that's pretty awesome. Um, a lot of students and probably adults would love to hear about how you were able to maintain a good work ethic. I know a lot of us are in a different environment right now <laughs> and having to focus. So what are some of your tips as um, as you've gone through your schooling and studies and a way to help you focus with um, all your scientific work? Yeah, so I think I'll just reiterate what I mentioned before, which is just taking a little bit of a break. Some of the times it, it allows me to have a lot more energy when I get back to things. Whereas I really don't like being in a sort of a 60% mode all the time. It's better that I'm 100% and then I take a break in between then. And um, other things are that I, I just do some stuff that I really enjoy inside and outside of the lab. I have a really awesome lab uh, uh, that I work with right now. And so they're able to, we're all able to help and, and uh, maintain motivation, um, which I think works into a strong work ethic. And I'll also mention my, my family. Um, a lot of my family members actually created their own businesses and they were, were and are entrepreneurs. And so it's always been like, you just have to work as hard as possible and then you will, you will get what you have worked for. Um, and so I kind of keep that in mind as well. And I'll mention one other thing is that when I was in, all the way back to middle school actually, I was working in my family's restaurant and so a lot of my weekends back then were doing more of this work and I've kind of just tried to always keep that mentality to to work hard and um, knowing that I'll that I'll get a lot out of it in the end and you help a lot of people too a lot of those babies with the heart defects <laughs> that's amazing did you have any obstacles you had to overcome as you were becoming a scientist and um, getting to SVP? Mm -hmm. So I think really early on, I was just nervous about other scientists. I had studied, um, I really enjoyed chemistry and biology early on in school, but I didn't really know what a scientist was. I knew what they looked like from books and movies and they kind of seemed quite scary. And so that was pretty intimidating for me very early on, but I started to realize that well, scientists can look like anyone and they can sort of act like everyone, anyone as well. And so that kind of broke down some of those walls for me to start pursuing work in a research lab. And um, let's see, and, and then actually getting into the there's a whole process of getting into graduate school and it looks kind of similar to getting into uh, a bachelor's program when you're finished with high school as well. And it was difficult. And I actually was back in Canada when I was applying to all these schools. So it was sort of this big black box of, I have no idea what's going to happen when I get there. I have never met these people before. Um, but then I ended up doing some interviews with programs and meeting people and actually coming down to California before I started and was able to make my decision based off of that. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's good for the students to realize that scientists are people just like everyone is people and first yes. <laughs> and women and men and we come from all different backgrounds and all different countries and um, just like 
every other profession. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think sometimes they, a lot of people have the idea we all have white hair. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what I thought early on too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's great for everyone to know. There's another question about your research. Um, when you're dissecting a fruit fly, is there anything specific that you're looking for um, during the dissection or is it multiple things that you're investigating? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll do during the dissection and then after the dissection. So during the dissection, you have to be really, really careful not to touch the hearts because they're basically destroyed if you do. And when you look under the scope, and you have these uh, tweezers in your hand, you think you're gonna destroy everything, but practice makes perfect and it, it um, can get a lot easier after. But if you do just tap the heart, it'll start beating really, really quickly, um, something called fibrillation, and you have to throw that fly out. It's, it's, no, it's no good to look at anymore. You've kind of ruined what you were trying to look for. And then, after that, you have this sort of preparation of a, of a fruit fly, and then you go and take it to a microscope, and then you try and um, take the best videos possible of the beating fly heart. And interestingly, when we take the videos, sometimes we can see differences in those hearts. For example, sometimes we'll see, well, part of the heart is missing, or it looks like there's extra tissue here or whatnot, but then, after that, we put those videos through a special software program, and that's able to kind of spit out all of these other parameters that we're interested in, like, like the size and arithmicity, and sometimes you can see how well the hearts are contracting as well. So sort of um, along the way, you can kind of look at, um, at the hearts while we're doing the dissections and filming. That's wonderful. Yeah, a lot of um, labs that I've been lucky to visit. We use um, AI and software technology. And um, I think that sometimes people don't know that biotech, there's a lot of tech <laughs> involved in figuring out our problems because um, there's a lot of data you have to sift through, a lot of flies to look at. <laughs> yes. yes, I think our lab uses up some of the most data out of my whole institute because we have to take these videos of every single fly. <laughs> oh yeah, so, wow. <laughs> think of a large portion of data in the end. <laughs> that is a lot of data to search through for sure. <laughs> um, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our audience? We tried to go about 45 minutes and we're um, wrapping up. I just wanted to give you a little chance if there's anything else you wanted to share with the participants. Yeah, I think I'll just mention again that if anyone is interested in trying science or pursuing it just even just a little bit um don't be afraid to reach out to someone and even if you have to reach out to someone who reaches out to someone else for you to go visit their lab or go see how things are you'll realize that we're just people we we do our work we go have lunch together and then we go do some more work and it's it's a lot more normal than a lot of you think. So don't be afraid to reach out to a scientist to just learn a little bit more about the work that they do. They're likely really excited to tell you about it in the end. <laughs> yeah, I love that about scientists. They're almost all of them would love to share what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really appreciate your time, Katya. You've been really great and um, your awards were very well deserved. You're very good at presenting your data and your information um, to all audiences, and we really appreciate your time um, and sharing your research with us and your path to becoming a scientist. And um, we have these webinars every week, friends. If you would like to come to another one in the future, we have one next week on Thursday as well, um, and you can meet some other really cool scientists like Katya. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Kirsty. Thanks. Bye-bye.